This is Karen with NewClevelandRadio.net, and it is time for Avoid the Maze with Gary Moss, and his subject is on diabetes. And we did one a couple of weeks ago that we posted, and a number of people have responded to it um, in various different ways. And, um, you know, we decided that we're going to keep this going, and so... Gary, I'm going to turn it over to you because uh, this is your show. Well, thanks, Karen. I um, have shared with everyone that I have diabetes. It was uh, recognized in me oh, about uh, 21 years ago, the year 2000. And um, in the year 2000, I was 58 years old. and um, I wasn't surprised, but um, I, it was one of those things that I didn't think was going to define me. And um, as I got into it, uh, yeah, it, it's like the major part of what I deal with every day. So one of the ways that I thought I would like to uh, bring this to you and our audience um, I started writing about it. And what I'd like to do is read a paragraph or two from what I've written and see if it stirs up any kind of a uh, conversation. Um, and I think there's a possibility. And I'm sure that some of these ideas and thoughts that I've put down, um, other people who um, experience diabetes will identify with. But these aren't some of the things that uh, doctors talk about right. with you. And yet they're major questions and influences on my life. And um, let me begin. Um, the title is Diabetes Doesn't Care. And um, when we have diabetes, um, it seems to preoccupy us all the time. We're testing blood, we're measuring things, we're trying to predict what our next meal should and shouldn't be. Um, should I allow myself this treat or not? By the time you become a senior citizen, one or more of your internal organs has most likely begun to sputter, and you ain't that perky no more. Diabetes doesn't care, and sometimes it bears its teeth and rubs its hands together with glee and anticipation. I can sort of picture it out there. You know, I've got you now. Right. And uh, that's how I feel a lot of the time. Did my eating habits during Christmas past contribute to my current dilemma? Diabetes doesn't care. Could I or would could I or would I have eaten any differently back then in, during those times? Probably not. Too often my attitude is. I'll live for today and deal with the consequences later. Don't cry for me, Argentina. Tears aren't going to solve anything. If I continue to bitch and moan, people will start avoiding being around me. I'll develop a reputation being that miserable jerk. So, with this idea of would you have done things differently earlier, knowing that maybe you're going to get diabetes. And we really don't know how much sugar and dessert I had to eat 20 years ago or 25 years ago to bring on this condition. Any you know, thoughts? well, you know, it's interesting because I'm not sure from everything I've read that 
the foods we've eaten previously really contribute to it. Um, because nobody seems to know why some people are born with diabetes or get it as they get older or somewhere in between. And I don't know if I would have eaten differently other than maybe I'd be a little bit thinner, but, you know, we grew up in a family where, um, food and desserts, uh, is what we thought made us happy. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people in our generation were brought up that way. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what your ethnicity is, you know, there's those great Italian mothers, and there's those great Jewish mothers, and there's those great, you know, Taiwanese mothers, and they all wanted to feed their children, and they all had their specialties, and every holiday is revolves around uh, food right. at somebody else's table, and you're right. Uh, well, I'm pretty clear with myself. No, I wouldn't have done things any different. And I remember what our father used to say all the time when it was evening time and he needed his dessert. You know, he had a number of different conditions that should have regulated what he was eating. Right. And yet he didn't care when it came to that time in the evening when he needed his sugary dessert and he had his favorites and he would probably try to stick to them. Unfortunately, everything is my favorite. <laughs> well, and you know, again, we're talking about diabetes because that's what you have and that's what you have to deal with. Um, going back to our father, um, he had a heart condition. And he was told not to smoke. And so he chose to go from cigarettes to a pipe, which he was told uh, you shouldn't even be smoking a pipe. Um, he was told not to use salt and he loved salt and he put the whole salt shaker on his food. So we also learned from him to a great degree to live for today. Because we right. don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Right. Now, does that mean? And I, I still feel that way today, even with my diabetes. Um, I think I mentioned this in an earlier uh, show. Um, I heard on a commercial that if you come to this free dinner, we'll tell you you can get rid of your diabetes 100% by following our um, suggestion. Sure. So I went for the free dinner and I liked what I heard. And it was based around diet. The person that was leading it was a doctor, an MD. She was also a chiropractor, and a lot of chiropractic practices focus on food and to solve problems. And she had a very hefty price tag. Of course. $5,000, and it was a three-month program. And I didn't have $5,000 to throw away on anything. But I was, this was about five years ago. So I was 15 years into being a diabetic. And I didn't like all the restrictions. And I didn't like some of the side effects. Right. Especially the lows. Uh, when you have, my experience is, when I have a sugar high, I feel just fine. And I've had numbers that other people look at and they said, well, you should be dead with that number. My number's been over 500. Wow. But when it's over 500, I feel just fine. 
it's uh, destroying the organs inside my body, but not in a painful way. On the other hand, when I have a low, and for me a low is if my blood sugar is less than 90, 85, something like that. I sweat profusely. I could sweat off five pounds in five minutes. Wow. I'm wringing wet. I put a bath towel on my chair and sit on it. And I'm sitting on it right now because I had a terrible low. I think it was early this morning. Yeah. It was actually right after I went to bed and I knew something was wrong. And I came and I checked my blood sugar and I was having a low. And so I, I know what to do. And all of us that have diabetes have a remedy for when we have a low or when we have a high. And so my, what I do, a navel orange will immediately shoot my sugar back up maybe 50 to 100 points. And so I cut up a navel orange and I took a bottle of soda that I enjoy and I took two cookies and I sat down on my chair and I knew that if I consumed these things in 20 minutes, the symptoms would go away and I would be back in a normal range. Okay. So that's the kind of thing that I do. I'd like to read a couple more paragraphs here sure. and see if it brings up something. Recently, I've spent too much time looking for someone else to blame for my diabetic predicament. It's obvious who gets the blame if you have an even moderate memory. There were two women who poisoned me while never even hinting about the connections between today's menu and tomorrow's ailments. They impressed upon me, they never impressed upon me that diabetes doesn't care. And I don't know that I would have listened to them back then. Both of those ladies were known to be food pushers. They were often overheard using their favorite phrase, es mein kin. And those two ladies were my mother, your mother, and our grandmother, our mother's mother. Once I tried to make a case against uh, seeking sympathy from people like Oscar Castorius and others who have major, you know, complications sure. in their lives, but I was putting myself, poor me, above people with real issues. And I don't know if, if that's what other people do too. We usually are the center of our own universe to some extent. And yet I watched a uh, clip on TV about a young man who was born without any arms or legs. Hmm. Can you even imagine? Um, they weren't able to even fit him with prosthesis. He became a head football coach. I saw that, yes. You saw that? Yeah. I can't remember his name, but I was quite impressed watching him coach his football team right. to a championship. And, you know, if someone can do that, uh, Oscar is a runner who ran in the Olympics without his own legs. Yep. He rode on, you know, those springy uh, prosthesis that uh, he would wear. And so there are all kinds of incredible stories. And darn it, if people can do that, why am I making such a big issue about poor me and my diabetes? So one of the reasons may be um, 
obviously can be the way, you know, you grew up, the things that you heard around you. Um, and I'll give it for instance, and I'm, I think many of our listeners will relate to this. Um, the only thing that I knew about diabetes growing up was that um, our grandparents on our mother's side both were diabetic and, uh, you know, they used those little saccharin tablets as before we had, you know, all the powdery stuff that we have today. Um, and, you know, they would go out and they would buy uh, certain cookies that were for diabetics. Um, and a lot of their stuff didn't taste all that great, mm -hmm. but because of where they had come from, they came from, you know, Russia, where uh, they lived through a lot of persecution. Um, they came over to the United States, you know, on a ship and steerage. And so maybe for them, this bland, yucky food that I know we sampled a couple of times um, was okay for them. And, uh, you know, did their life get extended any more uh, because they did this? Uh, I can't say for sure. But again, it's what, you know, we get used to. Um, you know, our and mother... we really don't know how far they they took it. We, we saw the times when they used these things. Right. And for me, when I was working with that diet doctor for the first three months, I followed the lead religiously and things improved related to the diabetes. But I was yearning for food. The things that they had me eaten, eating uh, were obnoxious and they, seem to be good uh, examples in terms of the way they seem to live, but I wasn't living with them. Right. So I didn't know whether they were just giving me a story or whether, you know, it was something that a lot of people were able to follow. Well, and as we talked about in the last podcast, um, you uh, you have diabetes too, my, and my husband has diabetes too, type two, and you both are experiencing it differently. Right. Um, he can eat most foods. However, if he eats past a certain time at night, his levels will go up, but his levels are never anywhere near what you report even his lows are not as low as yours. He stays between like 115 and 140. And his doctor has told him that's okay. He doesn't really experience highs and lows. Um, and, you know, if he's stuck someplace and can't really get lunch, um, he may eat a candy bar for lunch. And probably for you, that probably would be one of the worst things for you. Um, and I will eat a candy bar occasionally, but I know it's going to shoot my sugar up 200 points. Right. And so I need to counter that by taking additional insulin. And it's being the chemist, yeah. trying to weigh uh, and understand and predict what number of insulin equals a candy bar or a cookie? And what happens if you take your normal amount of insulin and then you eat a salad without any salad dressing? And then all of a sudden, an hour and a half later, your sugar bottoms out because you didn't have enough sugar right. to counter the insulin that you took. And um, what doctors do if you're a diabetic, um, first of all, the doctors themselves, almost every single one 
knows nothing about the diet. They know nothing about diabetes. If they're a good doctor, they'll probably send you to a nutritionist. And I've done that in the last 20 years, at least four different times. And the nutritionist will sit you down with uh, some charts showing the, tr the food triangles and they'll recommend this and that. They never really recommend a specific meal. Now, as someone who has diabetes, um, sometimes they'll give you books of menus, of uh, recipes, but that's not what I want either. I would almost prefer uh, going to one of these companies that sell you, you diet food and have them sell, sell me diabetic food if their meals were tasty. And I'm sure there's are spices that can be used to make things tasty. But I don't have the time and the energy to make myself two meals, three meals a day that follow those rules. Right. Um, one thing that I've learned, I happen to like peanut butter. Now, I don't know that peanut butter is a good food for diabetics, but I know how to counter it with X amount of insulin. Okay. So a typical breakfast for me will be a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and a cup of coffee. Now, the diet jelly would probably be the best, but I don't like how that tastes either. And so I'll use the regular jelly but I have to counter, first of all, take a limited amount of that jelly and then counter it with the injection that I give myself before I eat that. Right. And I do that often enough that I can usually predict it and stay in a safe zone. So I really wish some of these food companies would get more involved in the preparation of food for diabetics. And even at the restaurants, it would be no big deal in my mind to have a diabetic menu. Well, and they could, you know, have one or two choices, you know, uh, on that menu or whatever. But one of the things that I'm hearing from you. And I think this goes whether you're on a diabetic diet or trying to diet to lose weight or whatever. Um, not everybody uh, consumes food at the same rate and burns it off. Okay. So I joined uh, this app and um, I write in every day what I have for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I weigh things, I scan labels. So that gives me the numbers and stuff. And it says, if I eat 1,200 calories a day, no more, and I'm exercising, that I should be losing a pound and a half a week. I've been doing this since March. I have lost zero. Now, the exercise has been helpful. It has, you know, tightened up certain things on me. But, you know, I'm not a vigorous exerciser, so it's not like it's melting off. And I went back to my doctor and I asked him. And he said, and he looked at the things that I was eating. And he says, you're making great choices. I said, but I'm not losing anything. And the answer to him was, well, you know what? Then eat a thousand calories a day. Well, even at 1200, there are a lot of days I'm really, really hungry. And so I get what you're going through because you're trying to do what you're told is good for you. And yet you're on this roller coaster. And, you know, it's, it's the frustration. And part of that is 
um, in our growing up, we were told and taught to believe in doctors. Um, and as we know, there are some great doctors and some not so good doctors. And even the way we classify them as good or not so good, it's based upon maybe our meshing of our personalities or an agreement with uh, the uh, plan that they have for our success, or maybe just simply that we're successful with one doctor and not successful with the other. Right. And the same thing is true about the medications and the supplements we take. Uh, one doctor who really believes strongly in vitamins tells you to take those. And then uh, a few months ago, I was having kidney problems. And on my own, I decided I'm going to go off all my supplements. And within a matter of two days, my kidneys were fine. Unbelievable. And, yeah. You know, what was causing, what was those supplements? Vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin D, a multivitamin, you know, all of these different things that in and of themselves, they're great and they're even necessary for certain conditions. And, uh, maybe it got to the point where I just had added so many supplements that the kidneys couldn't manage it could be that amount but the doctor never told me that see and and, then, the, and, that, and that's this universal um charting of our medications supposedly you know they tell you that there are certain supplements you shouldn't take with uh, a prescription drug and where I get my medication from, they have the whole list um, of supplements I take. So if I try a new supplement, it goes on this list. And they're supposed to notify me if, there's, if it contradicts. And uh, usually they don't. Sometimes I find out about it by accident on Facebook or somewhere, okay? But when you talk about supplements, they're being pushed at us right and left all the time. Well, everything is. And one of the things that I've been, well, I've noticed this years ago, uh, not just the supplements, but the new uh, meds that are being developed at record speed. Um, and if you watch uh, TV at uh, when the prime news part of the day, 5.30, 6.30, uh, every other um, ad is for a drug. Right, exactly. And then after they push the drug, they tell you the possible side effects. Well, the list goes on and on, and there's some scary things on there. Right. And many of them will even end with, and possibly death. Um, one of the drugs that I'm on now for the last two months uh, is one that they've been pushing, Jardians. Mm -hmm. Jardians is considered to be a diabetic drug, but it also protects the heart in some right. way. So um, this is the first year ever that I hit the donut hole okay. in my, the yeah. cost of my meds. And when you hit the donut hole in my policy, drug levels one, two are still basically zero extra cost. Right. But Jardians is like a level three or four. So the price went from $38 a month to $138 right. a month. And there are a lot of these new drugs that you see advertised that are tier three, four, and five. And um, most of us can't afford it. Not afford it. Right. Seniors can't afford those kind of prices. 
and things like Jardians are so new that there isn't a common drug um, that you can take instead. Right. So um, I was lucky that my doctor had a bunch of samples that he gave me for a whole month's worth. But I'm facing a dilemma that most seniors will face. What do I do after that month? Right. Do I go back to some other regimen that isn't as good? And why should I or anyone have to make that choice? Well, there there are some um, new things out there. And um, if anybody is interested, especially if you are on Medicare, um, but even if you're not, if based on your income, there are medical organizations that uh, will qualify you for free medication. Um, and we've been lucky enough to uh, find some of them uh, because my husband went through the same thing. Uh, his, uh, his medication that he takes, he takes an injection weekly. And the first two, three months of the year, it's $30. And yeah, you know, we can spare the $30. But when he hits that donut hole, it goes up to $300. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was lucky in years past to get samples from the doctor. Doctors are now getting less samples because the drug companies now are making it available. But you have to fill out some forms. You have to have your um, taxes, you know, available to um, send them as well. But we're getting closer to having some of those medications available to us. Mm -hmm. But it is scary. Like you said, if you watch the commercials, um, you know, when they say, you know, if you're allergic to X, Y, Z, this could cause death, but you don't even know if you're allergic to X, Y, Z until maybe you right. take the medication. <laughs> like, you know, how would I know I'm allergic to that? Um, mm -hmm. And then again, it means going back to your doctor and pharmacist and, you know, having somebody that you can trust to help you weed through that. Right. Well, I'm about talked out for today, Karen. Okay. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to put, if you would send me what you um, read today, we're mm -hmm. going to put that out on uh, the website so people can read it again. Um, we also want to hear from you. Um, and some of you did respond to Gary on Facebook and you told him some of the things that you do. Um, and maybe we have to sort of create this support system um, and come up with ideas and help each other out because. Uh, and the hardest part of all of this is that we're all different. Yep, it is. Absolutely. And as, as much as I tell you that, hey, this works for me, it doesn't mean it's going to work for you. And it's like uh, your husband, Rich, can eat that candy bar, but I really shouldn't ever eat that candy bar. And sometimes a single cookie will shoot my sugar up 100 points. Wow. So, uh, yeah. Even though you might hear an idea here, don't take it as the gospel. Absolutely. Um, but sharing is, is important because maybe there is something, but you got to think about it and you got to, you know, do a little bit of research. And we're going to help you do that as we continue the, this dialogue. So have a great day. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. It's evening here and uh, I'm going to call it a night. So okay. I'll Take talk care. to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.